pray. How well do you pray? I know we have some prayer warriors in the room. I know we have some people that are committed to persistent prayer. But how well do you pray? To that end, some might gauge the success of their prayer life by the product of their prayer. They would say, well, I know I pray well because I see the results of my prayer life. I know that as I am praying that uh, good things are happening. Maybe you're standing at the Red Sea and you see it parted before your very eyes as you pray. Looking into a stormy cloud, you simply look at the wind and the waves and you say, cease, be still. And you find great power in prayer. But if you're like many of us, you don't always feel like your prayer is very effective. There may be times where it seems as though your prayers go no further than simply the ceiling. Well, today I want to talk with you about effective prayer. And I do have good news and also bad news. Bad news is this will conclude the book of Ephesians for us. We have been making our way verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. And this is the last words of Paul to the Ephesian church. And it happens to be on prayer. If you were with us Last week, you saw how Paul concluded this letter with a general outpouring towards readiness, towards standing firm in the midst of spiritual combat. And to that end, he talked about the importance of prayer. Now, those people that would think of prayer as being one of the pieces of our armor, yet Paul does not metaphorically attach prayer to a specific piece of armor, but rather he summarizes his explanation of the armor of God with the uh, encouragement to prayer. And as we will see today, he continues with this idea of prayer and encouraging prayer for himself. And the good news is, if you've been looking to learn more about how to pray effectively, this message is for you. Paul gives us six principles on what it means to pray effectively. And I will tell you right off the bat, it is not a magical formula. It is not so much of what we say, but where we are and who we are when we say it. But some of these principles may be some just as a way of review. Some of them may be new, but all of them are important. So I encourage you to make your way to the end of the book of Ephesians, and we will pick up where we left off in Ephesians 6, verses 18 and following to the end of this very important letter. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 18, and as you are able, would you stand with me as a simple demonstration of respect for the reading of God's word? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you may know how I, am, how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you for the many principles in this great book that you have inspired. But now, Lord, as we come to effective prayer, we pray, Lord, that you give us a better spirit of understanding 
how we might stand and pray effectively. Father, we just pray that you'd help us to understand these principles, and more importantly than our understanding would be the application of these principles to our lives so that we might be better because we're here today. This we pray in Christ's name and God's people said. Thank you. you. may be seated. If you'd like to jot some notes down with me this morning, I encourage you to do so whether you've got our application downloaded or whether you've got a bulletin open. There'll be an opportunity for you to fill in some blanks there. But let me just encourage you uh, that the main idea I want you to get, there are practical expectations when it comes to effective prayer. There are practical expectations for effective prayer. Now we're going to see six of these expectations that Paul gives us, and we're going to see each of these attached uh, to a great understanding of what it means to pray effectively. Now again, effective prayer is not so much focused on the product although we might be tempted to see the results of our prayer. But effective prayer first focuses on the process and the person doing the praying. And as such, we should consider it a great privilege even to pray to begin with, to know that we have a creator of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who would not only willingly listen to us, but hear what we have to say and respond according to his will. Now, the question then is, what do we need to do in order to effectively communicate with the creator who has sustained us through Jesus Christ, our Lord? Well, there are six principles, the first of which it starts in verse 18 and simply just says it this way, praying at all times. So he starts with uh, the Greek word there is prosuke. may not mean anything to you, but that is uh, the most common word used for prayer. It just means that of prayer. Uh, to pray how? Pass is the Greek word for all, and kairo would mean season or time. So prosuke, pas kairo. Pray at all seasons or pray at all times. What is the exhortation to effective prayer? What what can we take away from that? Uh, you, You can remember what Paul wrote to pastors and he told pastors to be ready in season and out of season. That we should always... Uh, Be ready when it's convenient, when it's not convenient. So in the same way, praying at all times would mean praying when we want to pray and praying when we don't want to pray. Praying in the morning, praying in the evening, praying when? All the time. So here's the first principle that I wrote down that I think is important for effective prayer. Effective prayer can be steadily practiced. Effective prayer can be steadily practiced. It's not something that we just do on Sunday. It's not something that we just do once or twice a week. In fact, what does the Bible tell us? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks. And this is a reference, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God's will is that we are always rejoicing, that we're always praying, and that we're always thanking. How on earth can you always pray and always rejoice and always give thanks? Because it would seem as though you'd have time for nothing else. Is, is that what Paul is exhorting to us? To pray without ceasing, meaning that we would get up and as soon as our mind is conscious, we'd begin praying. And, you know, we can't really go to sleep because if we go to sleep, we'd stop praying. How do we, how do we pray without ceasing? Rather than the act of continually bowing before God in 
uh, literal prayer, the attitude of prayer, I think, is what Paul is talking about. The attitude of prayer would be not that you would come to God and say, God, it's me. We haven't talked in like 10 years, but I've really got this need, and if you help me out, I won't bother you again for another 10 years at least. I mean, is effective prayer only praying when it's really, really important? He's saying pray in every season. Pray at all time. Uh, that we would never hang up on God. That we would always have an open line of communication. That there are times where on your way to work, there are times where you're walking the dog, there are times when you're doing something that may seem mundane, but during that time, your attitude, your mind, is conscious of God. And you are communicating or communing with the Creator at all times. It's not like you are whisking yourself away to a private life that you don't even want to have anything to do with God. But all of your life is open to our God. That is praying at all times. That is practicing prayer on a regular basis. And that's the first thing to effective prayer. Effective prayer can be steadily practiced. Now it says praying at all times in pneumatai. In the spirit. Pneumatas or pneumatai, as it's in this particular text, refers to the Holy Spirit. That's where we get pneumatology or the study of the Spirit. Uh, pneumatas is the Holy Spirit. It could often refer to a human spirit, but it's not saying that Paul is praying in his spirit, but he's praying in the Holy Spirit. And what does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? Well, there are some things it doesn't mean. Some might think that this is referring to, as Paul has talked about praying in his spirit, he refers to that in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, I sometimes pray with my mind and I sometimes pray in my spirit, referring to a prayer language or speaking in tongues. This is not what he's talking about here. Otherwise, the rest of it, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, would not makes sense if he was talking about simply praying in an unknown language that would not be understood to anyone, including the speaker, unless there was an interpretation. Praying in the Spirit is praying according to the power of the Holy Spirit. We are praying to the Father in the name of the Son, empowered by the Spirit. It is a triune blessing of Father, Son, and Spirit all working in this act of prayer. So praying in the Spirit it would be, I wrote it down this way, effective prayer must be spiritually propelled. That is, that we cannot, out of our shouting, we cannot, through the amplification of our voice, get to heaven apart from the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God who even in our weakness will intercede for us with words that we cannot even understand. But the Spirit of God is working in us and as we are being worked on by the Spirit, then we will become more effective in how we pray. For instance, what is the main job of the Holy Spirit? What do you think? What is the main job? And its key is in his title. What does the Holy Spirit do? He makes people holy. That is, he regenerates us. He comes in us and he makes us alive. Not only that, but he convicts the world of sin. And by such, he helps us in our sanctification, being holy. And not only that, but he works in us to where as we are praying, when we are praying for things outside of God's will, the Spirit of God guides us and directs us in our prayer life. 
So praying in the Spirit would be praying in such a way that everything that we are saying and all that we are doing are in conjunction with what the Spirit of God is doing. We might call it praying in Jesus' name or praying in the will of God. But we are praying in such a way that we are blessed by, empowered by the Spirit of God. So first, effective prayer can be steadily practiced. We should pray without ceasing. Effective prayer must be spiritually propelled. We pray in the Spirit. Now look back at verse 18, and there's a third thing it says. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Is he getting redundant here? What does he mean? Pray with all prayer and supplication. We remember that's where it's somewhat helpful to know the original language. Prosuke is the original word that means prayer. And here he's using it as a participle, prosuke my. But then he's saying with all prayer. So pray with prayer. Pray with specifically pouring yourself out to God would be this idea. But then it also says and supplication. What does that word mean? Yes, it's a big word. Supplication's a really big word for a small word, ask. Asking. So with all prayer, we pray with all prayer and asking. Now here's the thing. Many times we think all prayer is, is asking. God, I need this. God, I want this. God, I need this. God, give me this. Oh, by the way, bless so-and-so and so-and-so. But prayer is more than just asking. Amen. All right? You're with me. It, it, it involves more than just asking God for things. What would be an example of something else we do in prayer that Paul might be reminding us of? Adoration, Adoration would be good. Or worship that we're coming before God and saying, God... I don't need anything because you've already given me everything. You're good, and that's good enough. I just want to pause and thank you for just being you. I mean, just spending time in praise. As you read through the entire book of Psalms, you see various ways of people responding in praise and worship. And that should be part of our prayer life. But not only that, uh, if you follow the ACTS formula, A-C-T-S, adoration, then you would have confession by which we are making ourselves clean before God. God, I've, I've done some dumb things, and I'm sorry about that. But confession should be part of our prayer, right? And what else? What's the T stand for? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. This is very similar to what Paul said in Philippians 4. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by Prayer and supplication, and he even goes on to say, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So the prayer, prosuke, and the de, de a race is the supplication, which just means asking. So you could think of yourself, when I'm praying... I need, to be, I need to be speaking in, let's call it variety. You can write it down this way. Effective prayer should be seldom predictable. I know we have some memorized prayers. And some of those memorized prayers might be really good, you know, maybe for kids. Now I lay me down to sleep. Soul to keep. Yeah, that one. You know, that's... And saying the same thing every night might be good as a child, you know, learning how to pray and learning what it is to pray or maybe as you're praying for a meal. But what did Jesus tell us to do when he told us to pray in Matthew 6? Matthew 6, he says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their Many words, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. 
So as we're coming to God in prayer, it shouldn't just all be about asking. Shouldn't be just all about praising. Shouldn't be all about thanksgiving. Shouldn't be just all about confession. But it should be a variety in how we're talking to God. And that as we are communing with God, it shouldn't just be the same thing over and over and over again. But there can be a variety in how we talk to God. For instance, do you pray standing? Maybe try kneeling. Do you pray kneeling? Maybe try sitting in a chair. Do you pray while you walk? Well, you see, there's various different postures. There's very different ways in which we can pray, but we should not become predictable in our prayer life any more than you would call and talk to anyone in the same way that we incorporate some variety. So that's the first three. And he continues in verse 18, and he gives us a fourth principle. And he says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Now, we talked about perseverance, and we talked a little about alert last time. You remember, uh, as we are standing firm, we need to be alert for the attacks of the enemy so that we can pray for other people that are under attack. Yes, uh, but part of that being alert, being on guard, uh, being awake at night as on watch is so that we can, with perseverance, maintain our prayer. So I wrote it down this way for point number four. Effective prayer needs to be simply persistent. Now you might call me on this and say, wait a sec, you said you should be variety. It shouldn't be predictable. How can it be less than predictable but still persistent? Did Jesus tell us to pray persistently? Yes, in fact, he told us some parables. One of those is in Luke 18. We're not going to look at it, but I'll just talk about it for a moment. But in Luke 18, he said uh, there was a parable of this unjust ruler who did not fear God and did not respect people. But there was this widow who came to him regularly and said, Vindicate me, for my adversary is seeking to do me harm. What did the unjust ruler do? Nothing, but the widow kept coming back. She persisted in her request. And Jesus said, what did the unjust ruler do? He said, unless this woman kill me from her constant nagging, I got to give her what she's asking. He says, if the unjust ruler was finally willing to give way because of persistence, how much more? Will God, who is not an unjust ruler, will give us what we need speedily. And persistence in prayer is continuing to bring things before God. Now, if God answers that prayer, great. We don't need to keep bringing it up. But if God doesn't answer that prayer, there are times where he wants us to persist. It's not like God needs to be told again. It's not like we have to nag him, but we have to demonstrate that this is something that is needful for us. This is something that we are committed to. And this is something by faith we're going to see God work. Now, it could be that God might simply say, no. So do we keep persisting? No. You remember Paul said, after three times beseeching the Lord to remove a thorn in the flesh, The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. And Paul learned something from that. But nevertheless, we should continue to pray. We should persist in prayer, not nagging God, but we should be committed to what we are praying for. And what should we be praying for? Well, look what it says. Look back in the text, verse 18. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So when I say what should we be praying for, let me put it a different way. Who should we be praying for? For everyone else. I wrote it down this way for, letter f- or for principle number five. Effective prayer could be strategically personal. That in our alertness, in our spiritual awareness that we're going to see people in need. And when we see people in need, what is our appropriate response? To pray for people. And that we're praying 
for people in their need. And we're not just praying in a general sense, Lord, bless so-and-so, bless so-and-so, but we're praying strategically in a personal way according to what a person has need of so that we might be able to discern when God answers that need. Loved ones, how do you know when God has blessed someone and if all you're doing is asking God in a general sense to bless people, how do you know when he's done it? But if you're saying, Lord, I'm praying for this person to get their heart right with God to where they'll get to a point where they're willing to get up in a baptistry and proclaim their salvation. Now, would you know when that happens? So praying specifically or praying strategically, praying for a need gives God an opportunity to work. Why? Because what is prayer all about? What is the goal for prayer? Yes, to do what? To glorify God. And that's what Paul is really talking about. See, when he says that we should be praying for others, he does not imply that the only thing we should be praying about are physical needs. So-and-so is sick. So-and-so needs a job. So-and-so having trouble with this. No, when you see people praying in Scripture, what do they often pray for? Physical or spiritual? When Jesus prayed, did he pray that the the person would no longer have hard feelings or they would no longer have hardship or suffering or did he pray that their faith would carry them through? Did he pray that they would have freedom from temptation or they would stand firm in the midst of temptation? See, there's many times where the prayers were not focused on physical needs but on spiritual needs. Why? Because what's the purpose of prayer? To glorify God. Take a look back in the text and you can see this in Paul's own request. Verses 19 and following. So you see verse 18 is him really giving us some principles on prayer. Following the spiritual combat that we are told to prepare for. And then verse 19 he's reminded. Hey pray also for me. That my words may given to me. And opening my mouth to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Think about this. If you knew of a missionary that was incarcerated solely because of them proclaiming their faith, and they sent you a prayer request, what do you think that would be? Hey, I'm kind of in jail. (laughs) And it's not because I did anything wrong. I'm over here preaching the gospel and I'm in jail. Help. But what does Paul do? So I want you to pray for me. But I want you to pray that I would say what needs to be said for God to be glorified. Not not help me get out of jail, but help me be effective in jail. It's a totally different perspective. Instead of praying for physical needs that come and go, praying for spiritual needs that will last for all eternity. This is what I wrote down for the last principle. Effective prayer may be simultaneously purposeful. It could be strategically personal, but also may be simultaneously purposeful. Think of it this way. In Colossians chapter 1, is similar to Ephesians chapter 1, we have recorded prayers from Paul. And Paul recorded exactly what he was praying for the Colossians and for the Ephesian church. In Colossians 1, it says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with a spirit of wisdom and understanding, so that you may understand what is the will of God. He's he's saying, I'm praying that you may be filled with spirit of wisdom and understanding so that you may understand God's will in order that you may walk in a manner worthy of God, fully pleasing and bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, with all endurance and patience with joy. The totality of Paul's prayer was about spiritual growth and effectiveness, not physical need. 
Now, is it wrong to pray for physical needs? No. But if the totality of our prayer life is only for the physical, we're missing out on a much bigger picture. So as we pray strategically personal for individuals, it can be simultaneously purposeful. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Listen to what he says. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That, that is a purpose statement, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And why will he do whatever we ask in his name? So that the Father may be glorified. So Jesus answers prayer first and foremost for what reason? To glorify God. That is, as we are praying, what should be the goal? Not health, wealth, and prosperity, but we want to see God glorified. And as we pray specifically according to Christ's will, that is, in his name, we are going to see God do an amazing thing in and through our prayer life. Now let's review. The main idea is there are practical expectations for effective prayer, and there's six of them. First, effective prayer can be steadily practiced. Secondly, effective prayer must be spiritually propelled. Effective prayer should be seldom predictable. And then principle four, effective prayer needs to be simply persistent. Fifthly, effective prayer could be strategically personal, and effective prayer may be simultaneously purposeful. Now, as we close, I want to look at the last thing that Paul said, and I want to see if we can connect that to prayer, and then I'm done. If you look at verses uh, 19 and 20, he's talking about pray for him, and then verse 21, he says this, so that you also may know how I am, and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Now, he's just told them about praying effectively. That is, in a sense, the conclusion of our spiritual wellness, or our spiritual stance against uh, all spiritual warfare, and then prayer, a big portion of that. As talking to prayer, he tells us how to pray effectively. And then as such, also pray for him. Uh, that he would be effective in what he is doing. Then Paul shifts and says, oh, by the way, I'm sending Tychicus. And he's going to come and not only deliver this letter, but he's also going to tell you how we're doing. Is there a connection between an update of a person's status and a willingness to pray. Is there any connection between me understanding how you're doing and my ability and willingness to pray for you? Would you say yes? I do too. So my opinion is this, that our ability of faithful prayer is directly related to practical Fellowship, And I close with this. Practical fellowship will promote faithful prayer. That is, when we have close relationships with other believers, that is koinonia, partnership, that is a willingness to share with one another, as much as we are engaged in fellowship, that will propel faithful prayer. Because when we gather together, and this is the whole purpose of our life groups. I know many of our life groups take a break over the summer, but we're going to begin them again this fall. But the whole reason that we stay small in the midst of a big church is so that we can know each other. And we can pray for each other. And we can be in battle for one another. We have prayer meetings throughout the week 
You know, we have a prayer meeting on Wednesday night. We have a prayer meeting on Tuesday morning. These are people committed to praying. And then as you have needs, certainly communicating those needs and being in fellowship allows us to pray for each other. And that's what's important is that you not do this on your own. The whole charge of standing firm in spiritual readiness is predicated on the fact that we do this within a church community. Not that we're trying to do this on our own. But we're doing this side by side, arm in arm. But loved ones, if you're looking to increase your prayer life, you don't have to go much beyond than practical fellowship. Because the more you spend time around brothers and sisters, the more you'll want to pray for each other and the more people will be praying for you. Now as I close, here's my challenge. How have you been praying lately? Can you say that you've been effectively praying? That you've been praying unceasingly? That you've been praying purposefully? That you've been praying in the spirit? Well, loved ones, if you need to change something about your prayer life, my challenge is simply that you do it today. Maybe you've recognized at least one area that you can improve in your own personal prayer life. Today would be an excellent day to say, Lord, here I am. I want to make this change according to your word so that I might be more effective in communicating with you. That's what we want to do. And let's pray about that.